Welcome to this episode of Fridays with Fintelect, where my guest is Jacqueline Shinfield, partner and co-lead of the Financial Services Regulatory Group at Blake Castles and Graydon LLP, based in Canada. Her practice focuses on all aspects of regulatory compliance in the retail financial services and payments industry at both the federal and provincial levels. She provides advice to regulated financial institutions and non-bank institutions, payday loan companies, money services business, foreign exchange dealers, mobile payment service providers, digital currency exchanges, and others. She has extensive experience providing advice in respect of Canada's anti-money laundering and anti-terrorism financing legislation, as well as Canadian sanctions legislation. Jacqueline assists financial institutions in their dealings with the Financial Consumer Agency of Canada and assists regulated entities in their dealings with the Financial Transactions and Reports Analysis Centre of Canada. She also acts for businesses and institutions in providing advice on compliance with the rules and bylaws of the Canadian Payments Association and codes of conduct of the Canadian Bankers Association. Jackie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Good morning. Good morning. So Jackie, at the outset, uh, could you give our listeners a quick overview of your professional career so far, how you got involved in the world of AML, CFD, and a little more about your current role at Blake's? Yeah, sure. So actually my history is I was a transaction lawyer. I used to do a loan agreements and, and act for banks and other financial institutions and lending money um, to, to, to corporate clients. And then in 2002, uh, Canada came out with the proceeds of prime money laundering legislation. And I was an associate at the time and I was approached by my firm and they said, you know, someone has to take ownership of this, learn this law. Uh, we have to do a bolt into our clients to understand it. And so they asked me if I would do that. And I was like, okay. And little did I know the journey that it would bring me on here um, almost 20 years later. So I basically learned everything I could about the Canadian law at the time. Uh, I started, you know, there wasn't a lot of guidance out there. I started going to conferences. I started you know, traveling to the U.S., going to conferences there, because, you know, fat of principles are fat of principles globally. And as time went on, I just got a lot of expertise in the area. I came to love it because you kind of feel like you're helping fighting crime in some ways, as opposed to just doing sort of plain black letter law. And so it just sort of came to me, if you will, by fluke, by being asked to, you know, participate and take on this opportunity, which I did. And so my practice has evolved in the in the anti-money laundering space to I draft policies, I draft procedures for clients, I help clients when they have they are examined by regulators um, to write letters to respond to deficiencies. I help clients when they've been fined by regulators to try to write letters to reduce the amounts of the penalties. I help clients try to interpret the law. Sometimes things are, are far from clear on what's required. Uh, we work together, we write policy interpretations to FinTrack. I advocate for my clients to both FinTrack and the government when things aren't being interpreted properly or where the regulators are being a little stricter than they should or where there's just some real deficiencies in the law that work on a you know, theoretical level but don't work on the practical level. So I sort of touch every area of AML, uh, terrorist financing, assist banks. You know, when banks have terrorist hits or, you know, they'll reach out to me, how do we do this? What do we do? How do we handle this? You know, how do we deal with sanction screening filters? So it just sort of started as, as a learning exercise and just has turned into so much more over the span of 20 years. That's, that's great, Jackie. So, Jackie, as an expert on regulatory compliance in Canada, what uh, you know, are the top few changes that you have seen uh, in the regulatory compliance domain over the years that have impacted banks and other reporting entities? Yeah, so, so that's a great question. So, you know, one of the, the more recent things is that our AML laws are changing effective June 1, 2021. Um, and so, you know, this has been in the process for over three years now. So there's been so much work to get institutions ready for these new laws that are coming into effect in, in a few months. Um, and so there's been a real focus there. So, for example, in Canada, uh, we report cross-border electronic funds transfers of $10,000 or more, either outgoing or incoming. Um, those, th the reporting regime has changed. So it used to be the last entity to touch the money or the funds before they left the country reported and the first entity to receive reported. Well, the whole reporting structure is being changed. So the first entity that gets instructions and the last entity that pays the beneficiary are now the reporting entity. So that's a huge compliance change. A lot of institutions that are smaller, that depend on larger banks as they're indirect clears, now have reporting obligations. 
Um, we now have amended our legislation to deal with virtual currency. So that's, you know, to the extent that you're dealing with virtual currency in Canada, now you're a money services business. And we've divided the money services business regime into domestic and foreign. So there's a lot of changes there. The PEP requirements have now added, not just a source of funds requirement, but a source of wealth requirement. So you're seeing all these requirements, um, changes in the travel rule, by way of example. The travel rule now has to, when you, on outgoing and incoming, you have to include not just originator information, but beneficiary information. And the regulators are interpreting our travel rule now to also apply to domestic payments which is a bit of a challenge because our domestic payments rail does not enable you to include the information. So that's been a bit of a challenge. So there's all kinds of um, challenges with getting ready for these new regulations. That's been really significant. Um, the other thing that's that's been significant over the years has been trying to deal with beneficial ownership. Um, and because it's very difficult to confirm beneficial ownership when there's no public registry. Um, and there's been different challenges over the years, you know, not just from an AML regime. It, banks in Canada are going to become subject to a consumer code that has a whole provision about treating customers fairly and understanding a customer's financial needs before you offer them products. So from a outside of the AML sphere, from a regulatory compliance regime. There is just so much going on right now for financial institutions at the AML level, at the consumer protection level, um, you know, at, at the OSPI, at the, at the regulatory level for our bank supervisors. So it's certainly keeping banks and me and others like me very busy. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, Jackie, Canada was recently at the center of uh, money laundering investigations involving real estate and the casinos and other sectors. So what would you say has been the impact of these cases within Canada, uh, both amongst regulators and within the financial services community? That's a great question. Uh, there have been a lot of changes that have been made in response to that report. Uh, specifically, it was a report filed in the province of British Columbia. So for those who don't know, Canada is divided into 13 territories, which is the federal jurisdiction. And then each territory has its own provincial government. Um, and so one of our uh, provinces, which is the province of British Columbia, got a lot of notoriety uh, for money laundering in respect of real estate and casinos. And so the province has really done a lot to try to address that. Um, so as a starting point, uh, the BC has changed their regulatory or they're in the process of changing their regulatory structure of casinos. Instead of the government having the BC Lotto Corporation overseeing casinos, they're establishing an independent gaming control entity, which will be called the IGCO, and that's going to oversee gambling and horse racing in the province. So there's going to be a new regulator for the gambling regime to begin with. Um, the second thing is in respect of the real estate sector specifically, um, the Real Estate Council of British Columbia, which is the regulatory agency that regulates um, brokers and realtors, there's an actual compulsory money laundering course now being offered that you're required to take if you're involved in the industry, and licensed professionals must take that course and update it. Um, the other thing that has happened is because there is a lot of informal banking, if you will, that's unregistered, um, the province of British Columbia is specifically looking into regulating money services businesses provincially. So right now in Canada, money services businesses are regulated by FinTrack. Uh, the province of Quebec has its own regime, but British Columbia does not have a separate regime, and they feel that they may be able to enforce more than the feds because they're there and they have hands on. So there's actually been a consultation on the regulation of money services businesses in British Columbia. Uh, in addition to that, the corporate statutes in Canada are in the process of being amended, and one of the statutes that has been amended is the British Columbia Corporations Act. And under that legislation, you're now required to keep a register of significant individuals. So basically, if you have a corporation and its ownership is another corporation or a trust, you basically have to trace down to the 25% level of beneficial ownership. You have to keep that as a formal corporate document, like you would have to keep a share shareholders register and the directors register and there's actually significant and severe penalties for not keeping that updated and there's an obligation to keep it updated. Um, and, and lastly, for, uh, completely different from anywhere in Canada, British Columbia passed the Land Transparency Act. Uh, that came into force in November of last year. And what that requires basically, if any non-individual is filing an interest in land or a substantial long-term lease, in addition to filing just the you know 
company X owns a property, they actually have to set out individuals who have an indirect interest in the land, basically beneficial ownership of 10% or more. And that's going to be a public searchable registry. So that is significant that they're now keeping a public registry of landowners in British Columbia. And on top of everything that I just talked about that's going on, um, there is a commission appointed by the government called the Cullen Commission, um, which is in the process of hearing from industry professionals and people involved in, in industry and people involved in banking, financial services, casinos, money service businesses, luxury good dealers, and they're doing a huge inquiry into money laundering in British Columbia, trying to come up with the underlying causes, and there's going to be uh, a paper written. It was supposed to be uh, recommendations by the commissioner were supposed to be published in May of this year, but because of COVID, it's just recently been pushed back to December. But in December of this year, based on months and months of hearings, there's going to be a, a paper that's published with recommendations of the province of how to try to deal with money laundering in the province. So in respect of what's happened in British Columbia and what's called now globally the Vancouver model of money laundering, there has a lot been done to address that. That's interesting. So, uh, you know, Jackie, uh, all around the world, I think regulatory expectations are increasing all the time. Uh, banks and financial institutions are under a lot of pressure to demonstrate effectiveness. But uh, incidents such as the recent FinCEN leaks suggest that regulators arguably have yet a long way to keep up with the private sector in terms of the ability to process the information that is uh, uh, supplied to them and also supervisory control. So what are your views on this? What do you think is required to create a more effective system? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And, you know, as technology changes, it's, it's very difficult to continue to keep up. And I can tell you, you know, regulated financial institutions, you know, have challenges. They do what they need to do. They invest a lot of money. The government doesn't quite have the same amount of money. So there are requirements to update systems. And, uh, and I think that is a challenge for the government. I can tell you that, as I was speaking earlier about our regime changing and the reporting changing, um, one of the things that's also changing is the actual forms that you use to submit reports and even though the law comes into force in 2021 in june the government's released guidance that says they won't have the forms ready until 2023 so even though they've passed this law and they've had it on the books you know at least in draft form until 2000 since 2018 they themselves don't even have the technology ready to have those forms ready for 2021 so it's certainly a challenge um, from, a, from an effectiveness and efficiency perspective, you know, one of the things that I struggle with and my clients struggle with is I find, um, you know, when we talk about money laundering and what we're really concerned about, it's really that, you know, obviously you can't stop every single amount of money laundering. And so you have to put your priorities in the big places. And so you have to put your priorities in catching, you know, professional organizations and catching people that are engaging in money laundering and catching and drug traffickers, you know, and what, what I find sometimes with our, our regulators and our system is there's so much focus on minutia. I'm like, well, you, you know, getting punished because you didn't put a phone number in a form, um, as opposed to sort of thinking of the big picture and what are we really trying to get at and what's effective and efficient. Um, and because of our privacy laws, which are quite strict in Canada, the financial institutions under the proceeds of crime regime actually become huge data repositories. We're required for collecting so much information in respect of our customers and clients and transactions. And these aren't just for suspicious transactions, which obviously law enforcement looks at in, in great detail, but just sort of 10,000, you know, when I was speaking of electronic funds transfers, I mean, you can imagine how many millions of electronic funds transfer reports are filed in a year for $10,000 going into or out of our country. So the, re the requirement of the minutia of detail on those forms, which aren't even trigger forms, which are just standard regulatory reporting forms, is, is very it is very cumbersome. And so I, I wish there was more focus put on, you know, reporting suspicious transactions, putting all the information in those forms. And if more information was needed, then, you know, the, the government or the police organizations could reach out to banks and say, give us more on this. But the actual, you know, the, the focusing on the, on the process and all the information being collected is, is quite broad. Um, almost too much for banks, in my view, and for other financial institutions, it's just become overwhelming. Um, and so it's hard to know what the law, law what, you know, FinTrack is doing with all this information. Clearly, they're focusing on the suspicious transaction reports as well they should, but they're just collecting so much information that at times it just feels like you're just collecting information for the sake of collecting it. And so that's really been a challenge. Right. Um, 
So, uh, Jackie, turning to the payments industry, you know, there has been uh, a lot of disruption, uh, you know, a lot of change, uh, technological innovation in the last 10 years or so. Uh, do you think it has led to a heightened uh, AML safety risks for the sector? And do you also think that regulation has uh, kept pace? So, so that's a really good question. So um, there is obviously heightened risk for the sector because you have many more players involved touching money. And so as money is flowing through different hands and different players, it's just easier to hide the nature of it and where it comes from. You know, the one thing about our AML regime is it's, a, it's an AML regime. It's not a safety and soundness regime. So when you register or become a money services business with FinTrack, um, you know, no one's looking at your financial statements necessarily or your business plans. They're looking at what you do uh, from an AML perspective. But when you think about safety and soundness and you think about regimes like a PSD2 where we're trying to require, you know, these innovative payment service providers that are touching consumer funds to make sure that they have um, requirements to hold funds in trust where they have insurance policies or where they have security lodged with a regulator, where they have requirements on data and things like that. I think Canada's lagged a bit behind. And I think it's, I'm going to lose track, but in 2017, uh, the government released a white paper uh, that proposing a retail payments framework that basically talked about anyone who's involved in retail payments and sending EFTs would require to be registered. Uh, the regulator is going to be the Bank of Canada. There's going to be capital requirements. There's going to be security and infrastructure requirements. There's going to be requirements to safeguard consumer funds. So all the kinds of things that you think of as being important and as regulating these types of entities is, is set out in this plan. And here we are in 2021 and there's no draft legislation yet. We're still talking about it. There's meetings. But, you know, when you look at other countries in the world, we're so far behind that way. And when I get clients from, you know, from the UK, for example, they'll go, well, what about this? I'm like, we don't have that. And they're like, what do you mean? There's no obligation to safeguard consumer funds. And I'm like, no. So, um, you know, any a lot of the obligations sometimes will come from the payment networks as opposed to from the legislation. So in Canada, we're, we are very behind in, in regulating these new payment service providers, if you will. Some are caught by FinTrack, but because FinTrack interprets a money services business to exclude payment processing, a lot of them are not caught. So there really is no regulation. So, um, you know, so obviously from those who regulate and, and who have these, as, you know, from financial institutions that have these types of entities as clients, they're obviously higher risk clients. You have to look at their transactions more deeply and their activity more deeply. But I feel like Canada is behind, certainly in having regulation of payment service providers um, and, and ensuring that they all are at least if not regulated by FinTrack, because they may not all fall within the definition, regulated under a payment service provider scheme, which we just do not have here. Right. Jackie, finally, you know, the FinTech community consists mainly of compliance folks. Uh, what is your advice to them in these uncertain times, especially when new crimes and typologies are emerging? There are pressures due to staff working from home, uh, new regulations, you know, as we mentioned, both globally and locally, rapid changes to the sanctions environment. What should they do to ensure that they can still be effective and efficient at their jobs? Yeah, so, I mean, from a personal level, you have to stay motivated and, and engaged, right? So, you know, it's hard to be good at your job if you're kind of uh, having a hard time coping and staying informed. So stay connected with your community, whether that's people at work, whether that's people in the compliance industry, stay connected and stay motivated. The other thing is, in this environment, compliance professionals, compliance professionals are needed more than ever, right? There's so many different ways um, that criminals are now trying to abuse the system given COVID, right? So, you know, things are moving more to an online space, not as much you're seeing in cash. And if you, you know, the one thing about money laundering and trends is it's fluid. It's always changing. And so it's really important to stay on top of what those trends are now in this pandemic world. I want to say soon post-pandemic world, but in this pandemic world in which we're living, right? So if you go to FATF, for example, there's all kinds of seminars online where they talk about the different risks that they're seeing now that are emerging in the money laundering terrorist financing world as a result of COVID and how crime is shifting to more of an online environment and how there's more online fraud and how there's more, you know, PPE type fraud. And so really, you know, in terms of staying motivated and staying on top of what you do, my advice would be stay connected with the people that you work with stay engaged understand that your job is important and understand that your job changes that's what makes it 
kind of dynamic. And so we have to respond to what's going on in the world around us. So you certainly have to stay updated on trends. Read everything that's happening from your regulator where they publish guidance and look around globally. A lot of times I'll find great information that there's no answer to in Canada that they've already considered in other countries that helps me put perspective and helps interpret the law in certain ways when you understand what it's meant for. So just stay on top of the trends. Try to keep yourself motivated. Try to keep yourself fit and eat well. Sorry, I didn't mean to get personal, but these are all important to keep you. And, and the other thing about the compliance world is we're all part of this community and a really close community. We all look out for each other. So stay connected with your community. Stay connected on trends. Watch webinars. Stay up to date on what's going on. Watch of guidance and just continually you know, watch the, the AML world for what's evolving and what the trends are because they've changed. They've definitely changed over time since the pandemic. Excellent. Jackie, thank you so much for joining us today. It was absolutely fantastic speaking with you. Thank you so much for having me. Take care, everyone.